ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله in islam history is extremely important as Allah Ta'ala he said, Ya ahl al-kitab lima tuhajjuna fi Ibrahim wa ma unzilat al-Tawrat wal injil illa min ba'di afala ta'kilun O people of the book, why do you dispute concerning Ibrahim while the Torah and the Injil were only sent down after him? Will you then not reflect? Imam Sa'di, he said, this verse contains an encouragement to learn the knowledge of history. For indeed, true history rebuffs many of the false claims that contradict that which is known from history. Now, one of the things that we find is having an incomplete history sometimes gives an opposite meaning of that which is intended. An example of this is you find when many speakers give talks about the diversity in Islam, they only bring up one example when trying to show how Islam is not racist against blacks or Africans. They only give the example of Bilal ibn Rabah. And by only giving that example, one may be led to believe that Bilal was the only black Sahaba. And there were no other Sahaba that were black or of African descent other than Bilal. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him because for the most part, he is the only black companion or African companion that we know by name. So it gives the appearance that there were none other than him. And this is far from the truth. So we wanted to mention some other companions that were black or of African descent, other than the great noble companion, Bilal ibn Rabah, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him. So the first companion that we'll mention is the noble companion, Amir ibn Fuhayra. And he is known as the companion that was buried by the angels. His name is Amir ibn Fuhayra. He was from the first and foremost to embrace Islam. And because of that, he was punished. And he was of African descent, born into slavery from the tribe of Azd. So Abu Bakr saw him and he bought him from Tufail ibn Abdullah and freed him. As Abu Bakr as Siddiq, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him, was known for buying slaves and freeing them. If he saw someone that was a slave, he would purchase their freedom so they could be free. Amir fought in the battle of Badr and he fought in the battle of Uhud. And we're going to see even in his death, he was benefiting others. So Amir ibn Fuhayra, he was fighting in the battle. And he was stabbed by a man named Jabbar ibn Sulma. And this man was a pagan. And this was during the expedition called the Well of Mauna. So when Amir was stabbed, he said, I have succeeded. And then when he died, his body began to elevate in the sky until his body was no longer visible. So the pagan man that stabbed him, Jabbar, he was amazed by this. So he rushed to Medina to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he told him what happened. And keep in mind, this man's a pagan, but he was amazed by this. And the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam said to him, indeed, the angels buried his body and he was placed in an elevated place. 
Jabal, he said, well, what did he mean when he said that he had succeeded? He was told he meant paradise. Upon hearing this, Jabbar embraced Islam. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with Ahmed ibn Fuhaira and Jabbar. Another campaign that we should know is Aslam the Ethiopian. Aslam the Ethiopian. He is from those companions that entered paradise without praying a single prayer. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him. So he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while the Muslims were fighting in the battle of Khaybar and they were held up in a fortress. Now Aslam was not involved in the battle at all. Rather, he was herding sheep. A Jewish man had hired him to herd sheep. But he came and sought out the Messenger of Allah Alayhi wasalam, and said, O Messenger of Allah, tell me about Islam. And so when he was told about Islam, he embraced Islam. And then he said, O Messenger of Allah, I have these sheep that I have been hired to herd by this Jewish man. What shall I do with them? And the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said to him, Tap them in the face and they'll return to their owner, meaning they'll return back all by themselves. So Aslam took a handful of dirt and tossed it in the faces of the sheep and they returned back home on their own. Then Aslam entered the fortress with the Muslims and prepared to fight the battle with them. He fought in the battle and was killed and he never had time to pray even a single prayer. The Prophet وسلم, said about him, right now he is with two of his wives from the Huriyin. He is with two of his wives from the women of paradise. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with Aslam the Ethiopian. The next companion is a companion that was guaranteed paradise. This campaign, as they walked upon the earth, they knew that they were guaranteed paradise. And this is a noble woman who her story is well known, although her name is not known by many. Her kunya was Um Zufar. Her name is Su'ira al Asadiya. Su'ira al Asadiya. And she is the Ethiopian woman who suffered from fits of epilepsy. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with her. So the great companion, Ibn Abbas, he said to the great scholar from the second generation, Atta Ibn Abi Rabah, he said, shall I not show you a woman from the inhabitants of paradise? And so Atta, he said, he showed me a tall large yellow Ethiopian woman and he said this is Su'ira al Asadiya. she went to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said O messenger of Allah I suffer from fits of epilepsy and during these fits my body becomes exposed so supplicate to Allah to cure me he said to her if you want I will supplicate to Allah to cure you, and your good deeds and bad deeds will remain as they are. Or if you like, you can be patient, and paradise is yours. This noble woman, she chose to be patient, but the thing that she could not be patient with is becoming exposed. She could be patient with the fits of epilepsy, and she chose to be patient and to receive paradise as a compensation, but she could not be patient with being exposed. So the Prophet salam, he prayed that she would not become exposed during these fits. And as the ulama mentioned, whenever they mention her story, they mention her extreme intelligence and her extreme modesty. As she was already a companion, and she could have 
just taking her chances with going to paradise. But because she was so intelligent, she wanted a guarantee of paradise on the tongue of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she chose that. But because she was extremely modest, she could not be patient with becoming uncovered. And some of the ulama, they mentioned that the only thing that was becoming uncovered is her ankles. But she did not want any non related man seeing her ankles. That's how modest she was. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with her. Now, another benefit to this story is Ibn Abbas was narrating this story to one of the great scholars from the Tabi'een, the second generations of Muslims. And this man was Atta ibn Abi Rabah. And he was a Nubian black man from the Nubians of Mecca. And he was the Mufti of Mecca. He was the man who would give religious verdicts when the people came to Mecca for Hajj. And the ruler did not allow anyone to do that other than him. So he was some considered to be the first Mufti of Mecca, an extremely knowledgeable man who learned from many of the great Sahaba. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with this noble woman, Su'ayra al Asadiyya. The next campaign that we'll mention is in a unique category. He is from the small number of men that actually had the name Muhammad during the pre-Islamic days of ignorance. His name is Muhammad ibn Maslama. Muhammad ibn Maslama. He was born 22 years before the start of Revelation. He was a large, tall, black man with a strong build and he was bald. He fought in the Battle of Badr, the Battle of Uhud, the Battle of the Trench, and all following battles alongside the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He did not fight in the Battle of Tabuk, and this is because the Prophet Sallam placed him over Medina to guard Medina during the battle. And he was known to be firm in battle. When others may retreat, he was firm during the battle. He also had sons that were also companions, Ja'far, Abdullah, Sa'ad, Abdurrahman, and Amr. He also had a brother, Mahmoud, who was also from the companions, and he was martyred during the battle of Khaybar. And the Prophet, alayhi Wasalam, prophesied his death before he died. Now, Muhammad ibn Maslama was given some tremendous advice from the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet, alayhi salam, one day presented him with a sword. And he said, indeed, there will be fitna, there will be trials and tribulations and splitting and differing. So when the fitna occurs, take this sword and go to Mount Uhud and beat on the mountain until the sword breaks. And then go sit in your home until the oppressor comes to harm you or until death comes to you. This hadith is collected uh, by Imam Ahmed. So therefore, when the fighting occurred between the Muslims, Muhammad ibn Maslama did not get involved in the fitna at all. And he died 43 years after the migration at the age of 77. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with Muhammad ibn Maslama. The next companion that we'll mention was a king of a place called Tihama, which is a coastal plain by the Red Sea. His name is Abraha ibn al-Sabah. This noble companion from Ethiopia, he embraced Islam without anyone inviting him to Islam. He embraced Islam all on his own by the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. His name again, Abraha ibn al-Sabah. Now, what is noteworthy about him is he comes from a famous family. His mother is the daughter of Abraha, the man who came with the elephants to destroy the Kaaba. And so when we know this, 
then we understand that the grandfather of the companion Ibrahim ibn al-Sabah, he met the grandfather of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is when Ibrahim came with the elephants in the direction of Mecca to destroy the Kaaba. And everyone from Mecca, they fled. And this, of course, is the year known as the year of the elephant. And this was around the time that the Prophet ﷺ was born. So when Ibrahim came with the elephants and the inhabitants of Mecca got word of this, everyone fled except the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, he said, I'm going to go speak with this man. So when Ibrahim saw Abdul Muttalib, he was impressed by him because Abdul Muttalib was very attractive and he had a well, he had a very nice appearance about him. So Ibrahim got down from his elephant and told his translator, translate between me and this man. So Abdul Muttalib, he said, I come to you to ask you to spare my camels and don't harm my camels. Ibrahim said to him, when I initially saw you, I was impressed by you. But now I see you are asking me to save your camels and I'm coming to destroy the Kaaba. Why aren't you asking me not to destroy the Kaaba, the place where you worship at? Abdul Muttalib said, I am the Lord of my camels. As for the Kaaba, then it has its own Lord. And the Lord of the Kaaba will take care of the Kaaba. And then we know the story that you can read in, in the chapter called The Elephants about how Allah Ta'ala destroyed Ibrahim and the elephants who were trying to harm the Kaaba. Now, Sheikh Huthimeen says there's another benefit to this and that we see that the supplication of the pagan, if they are going through a hardship or stress, is also accepted because Allah Ta'ala saved the Kaaba as they begin to pray that it be saved. Now, this man, Ebraha from Ethiopia, who was going to destroy the Kaaba, although he was not a believer, his grandson, Ebraha ibn al-Sabah, became from the noble companions. And he embraced Islam, as we mentioned, without anyone giving him da'wah, just by the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with Ebraha ibn al-Sabah, the Ethiopian. Now, there is another companion named Ebraha, the Ethiopian, but he is different than the man we just mentioned. This other man named Ebraha, the Ethiopian, who was also a companion, he is the man that arrived with Jafar, Jafar ibn Abdul Muttalib, with 32 Ethiopians. You know, the Muslims had migrated to Ethiopia so they could get some relief from the pagans who were harming them. And... Not only did an Najashi embrace Islam, but many of those with him also embraced Islam. And so they migrated with 32 Ethiopians to Medina. And Allah Ta'ala actually sent down a verse about them. He said, Those to whom we gave the scripture before, they are believers in it. Sa'id ibn al-Jubayr. He said, this verse is about the campaigns of an najashi who was the king of Ethiopia. They said to him, give us permission to go to this prophet that we used to find in our scripture. And so they went to the prophet, and they fought with him in the battle of Uhud. So keep in mind that there were many Ethiopians who embraced Islam along with an najashi May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with Ibrahim, the Ethiopian. Now, al Najashi, who was the Christian king of Ethiopia, he embraced Islam and became from the Muslims. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him. 
Now, he was not considered to be from the companions because he did not have the opportunity to meet the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, before he passed away. But when he died and it was revealed to the Prophet, alayhi salam, that he had died in Ethiopia, the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, gathered the companions and performed the Janazah prayer over him. Now, at Najashi, he had some relatives that were actually companions of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from them is the companion, Firuz, who is the son of the sister of an najashi Firuz, he is the son of the sister of an najashi Now, he was in Yemen when some of the false prophets began to emerge. From them was Al-Aswal Al-Anasi. And so, the Messenger of Allah salam, sent Fayruz to assassinate him. Al-Aswad was in his home, surrounded by his bodyguards, and his wife was with him. Now, keep in mind that the wife of Al-Aswad, this false prophet, she was a believer who was forced to marry Al-Aswad. After her husband died, Al-Aswad forced her to marry him, but she was a believer. So, Fayruz was her brother through suckling. So when Fayruz arrived at the home, she allowed him to come inside to take care of his mission. She snuck him in to assassinate al Aswad at the command of the Messenger of Allah So Fayruz stabbed al Aswad, and al Aswad began to bellow like a bull. And so the guards said, what's wrong with our master? And his wife replied, there's no problem. The prophet is receiving revelation. He was dying. Now, right when Fayruz had stabbed this false prophet, the messenger of Allah, although he was in Medina and they were in Yemen, he received revelation that the false prophet was killed. And he told his companions, this false prophet, al Aswad." was killed by a blessed man from a blessed household. The companion said, who was it, O Messenger of Allah? He said, Fayruz, Fayruz. This noble companion, Fayruz, died 53 years after the migration in Yemen. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with Fayruz. And there are many others, many others that we can mention. There's Um Yahya bin Ihab, the noble companion. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with her. There's the noble woman Khurqa, Umm Mahjan, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with her. There's the noble companion Naba'a, the Ethiopian, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with her. There are many companions from the men and the women. There's Wahshi ibn Harb, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him. There's Umm Ayman, Umm Ayman is from the noble companions and she is actually the caretaker of the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She raised him from a small child and he used to call her mother. He would refer to her as mother. And he said, she is from the remainder of my household. And he would give her gifts and he would joke with her and honor her a great deal. She actually has an amazing story of when she migrated from Mecca to Al Medina. She migrated from Mecca to Al Medina. Now, this has been measured at around 270 driving miles. Um Ayman, she migrated by foot. She didn't have any riding beast, any provision, or any water, and she was fasting during the journey. Now, when she was walking, migrating, when sunset, she was thirsty, but she didn't have any water. And she heard a noise above her and raised her head and saw a bucket suspended from a white rope. She drank the water inside the bucket and it fulfilled her thirst and she never became thirsty again in her life. She would say, I have not been afflicted with thirst after that. Although I would expose myself to fasting during the severe heat of midday, but I never became thirsty. And this hadith has been collected by Ibn Hazm and by Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. 
Also, Um Ayman is from the woman that has been promised paradise. As the Messenger of Allah والسلام, said, whoever will be delighted to marry a woman from paradise, then let him marry Um Ayman. And her son Ayman was from the companions. Her son Usama was from the companions. And she has a great deal of virtue. She was also a narrator of hadith. And you can read about her story and her interaction and how she gave a great reminder to the great campaigns of Abu Bakr al-Umar after the death of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa And her story has been mentioned in the book, The Illustrious Woman from the First Generation. Naam, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa subhanaka Allahumma wa alhamdulillah. أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت وأستغفرك وأتوب إليك